So how can we know that the process that we're on is right? And who do we need to bring in to help us make sure that we stick to that process to be successful? I have a few pet peeves in life. (laughs) One of them is watching performers or people make changes without measurement. Drives me bananas. Um, And this, to to your point about like golf swing on YouTube, when we document a a very high performer who will remain nameless, but was literally taking athletic advice from a Starbucks barista. (laughs) For those baristas listening, for those baristas listening to your to your podcast here, I appreciate what you do. I could not function in this world without what you do. So thank you. But you have literally no business or little business giving feedback to a tier one athlete. So my point here is, is if you're going to iterate a change, and all of us will, we're going to iterate process changes as we age and stage, whether uh, physicality changes, whether uh, you know, I'm talking to Johnny, a musician as well. As you age in stage, you may have to iterate changes as well. My point is change one thing at a time and measure that. Because if we change all three, I often bring up fly fishing as a great example. I'm a part-time, obviously, resident of Montana. Um, I love to fly fish. There's only three ways. If, if catching fish is important, and it isn't. I catch and release, I really don't care. But if catching fish is important, there are really only three ways that you can catch fish right? Where on the river, how many casts, and the type of fly you're using. If I don't catch fish and I change all three and I start to catch fish, how the hell do I know why? So I think it's important to really adopt an iterative process. I'm going to make a change. I'm going to measure that. I'm going to bounce it off valid and vetted board of directors or coaching staff or the people I trust in my life. And then I'll measure it and then make another change if necessary. Now, Alan, you brought up contingencies. And for some of our audience members, and sometimes myself included, it can feel like catastrophizing to think about all the contingencies and all the things that can go wrong. So how do we put together a contingency plan that will actually work to better our performance and not bog us down in a negative mindset that might keep us from taking the actions we need to? I don't see why it's catastrophizing to be prepared. Uh, Because things go wrong. Um, it's as simple as you're giving a presentation and so, uh, it always happens. Suddenly your your laptop decides that's the time to reboot and download the latest install, right? And now you got to kill 20 minutes. So be ready for that. Have a second laptop. Be ready to do it on a whiteboard, what, what have you. And think through these things. What if this happens? What if that happens? Uh, it doesn't mean it's going to happen. It doesn't mean you have to focus on that happening. But it reduces the stress because when that happens, you go, all right, I'm ready for that. Uh, I gave a, a speech last year at a conference and I practiced that speech. I was ready to go and I was two thirds of the way through it and boom, I forgot what was next. And I did not prepare for that contingency. So I, you know, I muddled through it. I figured it out, but uh, you know, there were several seconds of stammering on stage in an awkward audience. I tell you what, next time, I'm going to be ready for that. What if I forget what's next? Maybe I'll have a cheat sheet with me. Maybe I'll have a joke ready to go. I don't know. But it's, it's simple things like that. I, all, the only thing it can do is reduce the stress. The other thing I'll add, I'm somewhat biased as a, as a 20-year retired commander in the Navy, obviously. But in the military, we have this thing and had this thing called readiness. I think outside of the military, Aviation has it. You want your pilot and co-pilot to be, you know, very well versed in multiple contingencies if you're 35,000 feet or 36,000 feet above, you know, earth. In medicine, I hope none of us have to go through surgery, but when you go through a surgery, there's a medical team that has multiple contingencies in place. So we often view contingency planning as just kind of something that the really high-end astronauts, surgeons, Navy SEALs do. I actually say false. I scream false. I think all of us can can iterate and be ready with multiple contingencies. The, the good thing about having a contingency plan is it ideally won't cause you to catastrophize. Instead, it causes you never to exhibit the human stress response. If I have plan A, B, C, and D, and plan A and B die on the vine, and I had no plan C, I'm going to have stress. I'm going to be Alan on that stage going, oh God, now what do I do? Or if I have this plan built, it seamlessly flows into not a big deal. So I think, you know, for the the listeners, I would invite you to also start to build in contingency planning into everything that you do. 